We've seen a bunch of examples of representations. We've let them act on vector spaces to get FG modules. We've looked at some properties that you can check for your representation. But we haven't talked a whole lot about constructing representations except for the case of cyclic groups. So today I'd like to look at another method for constructing representations of groups. So we're going to use modules, FG modules, but we're going to look at a specific kind called permutation modules. So let's look at the definition of what a permutation module is. So if you have a group that's a subgroup of a permutation group, SN, and we have a vector space that's an FG module, and we give it a basis, if the group action behaves like this, and what this is saying is, so when the group element acts on a basis vector, we just let that group element act on the index of that basis vector. Now what does this mean? Notice that our group elements are elements of a permutation module. So these i's here are going to run from 1 to n. So this element is a bijection on n elements. So what this is saying is we just let this bijection act on i, the index of our basis vector, and that's how we're going to define our action. We'll see an example of this in just a second. But if that's true for all i's here in the basis and for all group elements, then we say that v is a permutation module, right? It's a special kind of fg module where a group is a permutation group. We say that it's a permutation module for G over F, and we say that B is the natural basis. And so I came up with this uh, example zero, because it's just giving you a better understanding of how that multiplication works. So to give you an idea of what I was talking about, suppose that we have a group element one, two, three, right? This is a permutation. One goes to two, two goes to three, three goes to one. If we have any vector, in a three-dimensional vector space, well, it's got three basis vectors, right? This guy, so we're supposing he lives in S3. This element exists in any Sn where n is greater than or equal to three, but let's just suppose that we're working with S3. So then we have a three-dimensional vector space, and so that any arbitrary vector can be written like this. If we get a little lazy, we might omit the basis vectors and just write it as a column with these components in there. But really, when we have a column vector, there's this sum with the basis vectors hidden in there. And so if we have a group element acting on our vector, well, our action is always linear. That's one of the requirements to have an FG module. It distributes over the sum and we can factor out the scalar. So we have one, two, three acting on this basis vector, and then one, two, three acting on the second basis vector, and then on the third basis vector. But what does one, two, three do? One goes to two, two goes to three, three goes to one. And so the, this right here, after we perform this product, just becomes the second basis vector. This guy becomes the third basis vector. This guy becomes the first basis vector, right? Three cycles back onto one. And so if we just rewrite that, bring, bringing the first basis vector over here, second basis vector, third basis vector, we can rewrite that as a column vector. And it has the same components as the original entry, but they are permuted, which is what you might expect from the action of a permutation group element. Notice that this matrix together with this basis is going to produce the same result. The action of this group element on the basis vector sends basis vector 1 to 2, 2 to 3, 3 to 1. But look at what happens over here. For example, if we multiply the first basis vector with this matrix, we're going to get 0 for the first entry. We're going to get 1 plus 0 plus 0 is 1 for the second entry, and then we're going to get 0 plus 0 plus 0 for the third entry, well that's just E2. So when I multiply E1 with this matrix, we get E2. And if you go through it and look carefully, you multiply E2 on, you're going to get E3. You multiply E3 here, you're going to get E1. So this matrix with this basis is going to give us the same result as this permutation module where we have our group elements just permuting the basis vectors. So let's see another example of this. So let a group be C3, the cyclic group with three elements. We have a presentation here. And recall that C3 is isomorphic to the group generated by the element 1, 2, 3 in S3. So it's a subgroup of S3. And I wrote it over here just to remind you that the element 1, 2, 3 does in fact have order 3. So consider the vector space that's some field cubed for the notation, right? This could be R3 or C3 or some other field with three products of it together with some natural basis E1, E2, E3 such that V is a permutation module for C3. So that means our group action just permutes the basis vectors. So one goes to two, two goes to three, three goes to one. But this guy, if we do it twice, there's three elements in our group. This is one of them, it's our generator, but there's also one, two, three squared. Well, that sends one to three, two to one, and three to two. And then if we want the action for one, two, three cubed, well, that's just the identity. So the action is just gonna be the identity action. So I didn't write it out, but that's a permutation module, right? We know how all of the group elements act on all of our vectors. 
because we know that this is a linear action and all vectors are just a linear combination of basis vectors so we know what to do from there. So now if we consider the map rho that sends our generator 1, 2, 3 to this particular matrix that we were talking about earlier and we extend it linearly, we have a degree 3 faithful representation of C3, the cyclic group of order 3, namely the standard permutation representation of C3. I know that it's faithful because there's only one element that's going to send all the basis vectors back to themselves and that would have to be the identity matrix. And this matrix right here, cube, does in fact give the identity matrix, and we'll see that in a second. So we have that it's faithful, and we have that it's degree three, because they're three by three matrices. I said it's the standard permutation representation because we're using the standard basis. We could have picked another basis, and we'll see that in a second. In the video on cyclic representations, I showed you that you can just look at roots of unity, so in this case, the third root of unity. So we know that another representation would be to just send our generator A, where A is our generator one, two, three, to omega, Omega is just the third root of unity. So this is a degree one representation that is also faithful. The only element that gets mapped to the identity is going to be the identity element. So this is also a faithful representation, but it's degree one. So arguably it's a lot nicer to work with than a degree three matrix, but this is not a permutation matrix. So I'm just showing two different ways that we have seen to construct a representation of a group and showing that some have advantages and disadvantages over others. So if we compare them in a table here, right, we have that a is one, two, three, a squared is one, three, two, I just did the multiplication there, and then a cubed is just one, which is the identity, and if we actually multiply out these matrices, that's what we end up getting, and if we multiply these complex numbers, we get omega, omega squared, and one. So that's my first example, looking into permutation modules and how we can use them to construct a representation, right? We just looked at how the group action was defined and how we could write those as matrices by looking at how they work on the basis vectors. A permutation matrix is always gonna look like this. The columns are always gonna have all zeros except for one entry that's gonna be a one. This is essentially telling you where your first basis vector is gonna get mapped. It's gonna go from one to two. Where's two gonna go? Oh, it's gonna go to three. Where's three gonna go? It's gonna go to one. Same thing here. Where's my first basis vector gonna go? It's gonna go to three, then to two, then to one. So that's what's going on with these permutation matrices. Now for a little bit of a more robust example, let's let G be equal to S3 itself. S3, every group is a subgroup of itself. So we know that S3 is a subgroup of some SN, so we can construct a permutation module. That's all that I'm saying here. S3 is a subgroup of itself and let V be the span of three basis vectors. And we're gonna let this be the standard basis, right? So we have EIs, damn it. That's right the first time. If these EIs are the standard basis, we can construct the following representation. So this is just saying, uh, let these guys that are spanning my space be my basis. Then we do what we did before, and I took my six group elements for S3, and I thought about what they're gonna do to the basis vectors. This guy does nothing, so E1 goes to E1, E2 goes to E2, E3 goes to E3. This guy sends one to two, two to one, so E1 goes to two, E2 goes to one, and E3 stays itself. And I just do that over and over until I have a permutation matrix for each of my group elements, and then here's my representation. Using the notation from before, this is just saying that the group elements in the first basis is this, for this row representation that I have here. But what if we pick a new basis, right? If we have our second basis, which is the sum of all three of my first basis vectors, and then E1 minus E2, and then E1 minus E3. Those are my new basis vectors, and these are linearly independent, so they do span all of my vector space V. What would our representation be in the second basis? Now we know that these two representations are gonna be equivalent, but let's have a look and, and see if they tell us something different about our space. So as an example calculation, I show you how to find the action of the group element one, two, in this new basis. And so all I do is let it act on each of these three unit vectors. So we have that one, two acting on E1 prime. Well, I don't know what that does, but I know that E1 prime, I can write it in the first basis. I, I do know how to express that. And I know how one, two acts on the old basis. So if I write that out, one gets sent to two, two gets sent to one, three stays the same, right? So we have this, but we can just switch this order and we go, oh, that's just E1 prime still. So the action of the element one, two on E1 prime does nothing, right? It re just returns E1 prime. If we look at E2 prime, it's a little more interesting. So we write E2 prime in the first basis. Well, one gets sent to two, two gets sent to one. But if we think about it, that's just E2 with a negative sign. I can switch the order back to normal. So the action of one, two on E2 prime is to multiply by negative one. Same thing here, we write E3 prime in the old basis. One gets sent to two, th three stays the same. But if you think about that for a second, that's the same as E3 prime minus E2 prime. 
If you don't trust me, check that yourself. But if we write that out as a matrix then, E12 in our second basis, E1 prime gets sent to itself, E2 prime gets sent to negative of itself, right? just multiplied by negative one, and E3 prime is negative E2 plus E3 prime. So if we do this a whole bunch, what we're gonna find is this particular representation here. And what's interesting about this is the action of every element is always gonna take our first basis vector in the new coordinate system and send it back to itself because it's just a sum of these three. So no matter how you scramble one, two, three, E1 prime is always gonna get sent back to itself. So for all of these group elements, we have a one in the top corner here because one gets sent to one, one gets sent to one. And, and we also have zeros in the top row because nothing is going to get sent to E1. So our entire representation lives down in the corner here. So in some sense, we've reduced our representation to needing to know about the entire three by three matrix to only needing to know about a sub two by two matrix. So all of these have this particular form, right? We have a one and then a row of zeros, a row of zeros, and then down here we have a two by two matrix that actually does all of the work. And again, using our other notation, and again, using different notation, we have G is our group element written in the second basis. That, that's just the representation I called sigma. And so we have that sigma and rho are equivalent representations. So this equation is gonna hold, and we can actually construct the matrices relatively easy, easily. Finding T, I just wrote in the first column one, 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 because we have E1 plus E2 plus E3, and then I have E1 minus E2, and then E1 minus E3. This is just standard linear algebra stuff that you should know from before. There'll be a math fact, if you will. And then I found its inverse, honestly, just by plugging it into an inverse calculator online. I didn't want to find the three by three inverse by myself. Permutation representations are sort of the golden retrievers of representations, because you can always construct them and they're always faithful. Unfortunately, this is where the analogy breaks down. The trouble with permutation modules is that you need to look at a vector space that has the same dimension as the n that you're looking at for the permutation module. So if you're looking at, say, S15, you're looking at a 15 dimensional vector space and your representations are gonna be 15 by 15 matrices. So these can get pretty ugly pretty fast, but you can always construct them and they will always be faithful. Now in some sense, we're kind of done looking for representations because we can construct these for any group that's a subgroup of Sn. And my man Cayley, or at least a corollary of Cayley, says that any finite group of order N is isomorphic to a subgroup of Sn. So for any group whatsoever, if we know which subgroup of Sn it's isomorphic to, we can construct a permutation module. From that permutation module, we can construct a representation, and we have a representation for all groups, so we're done. So thanks for watching my show. It was, it was nice. But of course, it's not that simple. That would be too good to be true. The two big shortcomings of permutation modules is one, that they're always faithful. Sometimes we want a representation to be faithful, but it turns out there's actually information that we can get from a slightly non-faithful representation. But the other issue is the size of the matrices that we end up having to work with. The degree of our representations end up getting very large very fast, and we have to do all this extra work to reduce our representations down. But this is a place to start. This is a way that you can always construct a representation for any finite group. So it is quite robust, but it's not without its limitations. So I hope that gave you something to think about when it comes to constructing representations. You know, where do they come from? The, the, birds and bees of representation theory. And as always, if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below. If you found this video helpful, please like and subscribe. And I'll see you next time when we look at reducible representations.